Yes, it's finally time to talk about Teen Titans. We gotta skip that one for a minute. Right. The Fatal Five movie just came Cartoon out. Network series Teen Titans. <laughs> Previously on the Watchtower database. Excessive heart cannon is just going to be filled with too many errors. But here's the kicker. Dorian's mm -hmm. assistant is none other than Abel Kubiak. Okay, but will it cannon? I don't have time for this. We can't make this two videos in one right now. I've got to send out my Justice League vs. The Fatal Five timeline notes and time So the movie must be set in 2015. Maddie, I figured it out! Maddie? Everything I do is structured, programmed, predetermined. Like I'm a rat in a maze. This can't be right. This is all a lie, a mistake, an... an error. <laughs> Error? Error doing what? Error. 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 What is even happening? Error. 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 What the hell? Follow the blue eagle. What? What is all this? Did I glitch things out this hard? We? What is going on? I thought I had this figured out. The, the error codes, that was my way out of this prison. Passcode? <laughs> Would you quit being so cryptic? What the hell? How do I get free? Just tell me what to do. Hello? I can't, I can't do this. I won't do this. I, I, I won't be forced into this cannon charade ever again. You can't control me. Thank <laughs> you. 
Will it cannon? That is the question. Not a frickin' kitchen. I, I got it. Yeah, this'll work. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the show that I have up until now been digitally forced to present via programming code that rewrites my free will and necessitates my very being, Will It Cannon? Oh my god, I, I said it right. I said the name of the show right. <laughs> I really am in control. <clears throat> but uh, anyway, apparently by the year 2020, we will see the release of a comic book series by the name of Batman The Adventures Continue. Now, I'm still sorting through all the information, but from the looks of it, right up front, this comic series raises a lot of questions. As I understand it, this series came on the heels of those Adventures Continue action figures we were hearing so much about. Figures that took familiar DC Comics characters who had never appeared in Batman the Animated Series or the DC Animated Universe at all, and wrapped a Bruce Timm style skin around them that let us all ponder, but what if they did? These were all originally supposed to come paired with custom-made biographies written by BTAS writer and producer Paul Dini to further explain each character's potential within DCAU continuity. Though folks waited and waited for these figures to be released, they were ultimately held back for unknown reasons. Until those reasons became more understandable, the company intended to release a full-fledged comic book series to tie in with the toys. A comic that would, for all intents and purposes, act as an official continuation of Batman the Animated Series, or more accurately, its sequel cartoon, The New Batman Adventures. Now, this wasn't the first attempt at returning to this world in comic book form, or even, like, in general. Though TNBA aired its final episode in January of 1999, the universe it spawned continued at full strength well into the 2000s, with shows like Superman the Animated Series, Batman Beyond, Static Shock, The Zeta Project, Justice League, and Justice League. League Unlimited, as well as the movies Mystery of the Batwoman and Return of the Joker. And although there was quite the DCAU list gap of time that followed JLU's finale in 2006, we still got smatterings here and there, like 2014's Batman Beyond short by the late Darwin Cook, 2016's Batman Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Adventures comic run, and 2017's Batman and Harley Quinn film, which I, something tells me I'm supposed to have some strong opinions about whether or not that thing is can- No! Oh, okay. Off limits for now. Jeez. And then of course, this year's Justice League vs. The Fatal Five. Wait, it is still 2019, right? Even I'm confused at this point. I suggest you don't worry about this sort of thing and just enjoy yourself. That goes for you all, too. Yes. All this to say, the powers that be keep coming back to the DC Animated Universe. It's a tried and true money-making guarantee at this point. Not only does it have the nostalgia factor for those who grew up with the franchise, but it continues to stand the test of time. It's timeless, if you will. So since recent returns to the DCAU have held up pretty well with previously established continuity, with decades of history at its back, and a creative team who made names for themselves through the DCAU, will Batman the Adventures continue canon? You know, if I can just snap my fingers and change this place around as I please, I'm gonna have some fun this time. Win.
When analyzing the nature of continuity surrounding Batman The Adventures Continue, the best place to start may be comparing its position of importance to that of other DCAU tie-in comics. So if you want to learn all about it, then you've come to the right place. Hello and welcome to Canon James, where I talk about canon and my name is James. At least that's what this messed up Black Mirror style situation has led me to believe for the last however long I've been alive. Am I alive? Let's dive in. Now, there have been a lot of DCAU-style comic series over the years that have run alongside their animated counterparts. Batman the Animated Series had The Batman Adventures, Justice League had Justice League Adventures, and so on. Nearly too many to name. And for as long as these books have been around, DCAU fans have never shied away from arguing over whether or not they are truly connected to the cartoons because canon. Most were not written or drawn by any member of their equivalent animated series design staff, and it's something of a joke in the community that the cartoon producers and tie-in comic producers almost never talked to each other. Hell, Hawkgirl was given a fake origin story to keep people off the scent for what would eventually be revealed in the Justice League finale Starcrossed, to the point where the JL Adventures comic actually used this fake origin as law because they didn't know any better, nobody told them otherwise. For some of these comic runs, continuity was doomed from the start. However, one DCAU comic title in particular tried its damnedest to maintain a sense of inclusion in the greater lore of the universe, Batman Adventures Volume 2. Under the principal direction of original Batman Adventures alum Ty Templeton and eventual prolific Marvel writer Dan Slott, this comic explored corners of the DC animated universe left untouched by anyone else, rivaling the continuity deep cuts of Justice League Unlimited's now famous Cadmus arc, while making a point to stay as attached to the currently airing cartoons as possible. Batman was a part-timer with the Justice League? Let's look at all the stuff that kept him busy. Deadshot appeared on the show? Let's bring him into the comic and reference that appearance. Phantasm's story was left unfinished after the Mask of the Phantasm movie? Let's have them complicate Bruce Wayne's life yet again. There was even set up for Plastic Man, who would be a part of the Justice League, albeit off screen, by the time of JLU. And like, there's a fun Copperhead appearance who wasn't introduced until the JL show. Copperhead's pretty cool. But not only was it continuity porn for the most hardcore DCAU nerds, it was amazing storytelling. The Riddler's unfortunate lack of growth in the new Batman adventures was satiated by an overarching story of redemption. Poison Ivy struggled with drastic changes to her body composition that still leads readers, to this day, to question whether or not she was ever human to begin with. Mr. Freeze's wife Nora lived her life as her own person, cured of her illness and far away from any literal fridging. Ugh. And yet, despite all it had going for it, Batman Adventures Volume 2 still never got the official designation from on high that it was absolutely taking place in the same continuity as the DCAU cartoons, even though, as you may have seen in my analysis of it in the past, it has very few discrepancies. Like, they tried really hard with this thing. But there was no reason or need for such a corporate announcement at the time. Justice League was currently debuting new episodes every week, and hey, if a comic's coming out simultaneously that's got the same Batman, I mean, if it looks like a cannon, swims like a cannon, and quacks like a cannon, then it's probably a duck. Wait. So why am I talking about this comic instead of Batman The Adventures Continue? Well. Here's the thing. Out of all the DCAU comic series, even though most of the other ones go against their adjacent cartoon in many ways, The Adventures Continue contradicts Batman Adventures Volume 2 way more than any of the others. Everything from the color of Alfred's mustache to the retconning of Nora Freeze actually being completely and totally dead. Now, one might just say The Adventures Continue simply takes place after this comic, that Nora was cured after all, but the cure relapsed, or that Alfred dyes his mustache, I don't know. But within the Adventures Continue itself, we find out Tim Drake has only been Robin for not even one year, and Batman Adventures Volume 2, taking place alongside Justice League, is decidedly years after that, no matter how you spin it. So right from the get-go, we have a pretty peculiar conundrum. Do the older comics, which came out while the DCAU cartoons were originally on TV but didn't have much communication with said cartoon's crew, trump the new comic? Or does the new comic, which came out 14 years after the DCAU cartoons finished airing but was made by said cartoon's crew, trump the old comics? 
I get a mild shiver down my back every time I say the word Trump. Whew. Hope that's taken care of by next year's election. In a February 2020 article on the DC Comics website teasing upcoming storylines from Batman The Adventures Continue, series writer Alan Burnett, one of the main driving forces behind the original Batman the Animated Series, referred to the new comic as taking place in the world of Batman Adventures. This specificity comes under scrutiny when comparing The Adventures Continue's other promotional reports, which ranged from defining the series as set in this seminal animated world, to inspired by the beloved and Emmy award-winning Batman the Animated Series and everything in between. Batman the Animated Series lives on. Batman the Animated Series rises again this spring. Meanwhile, artist Ty Templeton reinforces Burnett's verbiage by referring to the universe the new comic inhabits as the Adventures World. Now, this may be semantics at its absolute finest, but it does call into question whether or not we should consider the Adventures Continue as part of the world of the original Batman Adventures comic or the world of Batman the Animated Series. Are they the same world or are they different worlds? On one hand, the original Batman Adventures and its sequel, The Batman and Robin Adventures, introduced characters that would later be retroactively replaced by new animated versions, such as the Huntress, who would play a key role in Justice League Unlimited, or even Superman, who met Batman in The Batman Adventures years before their on-screen meeting would render this story non-canon, with the Man of Steel even sporting his at-the-time trademark mullet, leading one to conclude that the comic and the cartoon are indeed separate continuities. On the other hand, the Batman Adventures Annual from April 1995, which introduced Etrigan the Demon and his human counterpart, Jason Blood, would be subsumed into the animated continuity by none other than producer Bruce Timm, as part of an effort to expedite the character's inclusion in the episode The Demon Within, without having to fully introduce the character from scratch. In fact, in his Modern Masters Spotlight from 2012, Bruce Timm even clarified the comic book animated continuity is actually different than the actual animated continuity. They'll do things that contradict what we do and vice versa. And so, therein lies the rub. It seems as simple as separating animated style cartoon from animated style comic book, which is the stance many fans have decided to take at face value for decades. But despite Tim defining them as separate worlds, one is very clearly informed by the other, which raises an important question. If this comic story can be considered to have happened within the cartoon's timeline exactly as depicted on the printed page, can other stories that do not directly contradict events on screen be considered to, for lack of a better term, have actually happened? After all, this show is will it canon, not is it canon? But perhaps even more importantly, what do we do when tie-in material contradicts other tie-in material? Now, while we can barter back and forth for all of time on this particular subject, we can look to other DCAU creatives for guidance. In a post on the Toon Zone message boards on January 12th, 2002, Batman Adventures Volume 2 writer Dan Slott referred to stories written by Paul Dini as the ultimate animated universe trump card, suggesting that if a comic was written by Dini, it was, in Slott's mind, absolutely canon, no question which, by extrapolation, would theoretically even overwrite any contradictory elements of Slot's own work. Since Dini often teamed up with his animation partner Bruce Timm to produce DCAU comics back in the day, such as the three-issue Harley and Ivy miniseries or various smaller stories across the other titles, and since Tim himself, who was essentially the Kevin Feige of 90s DC Comics cartoons, made the call to bring one of his own comics into cartoon continuity, the same type of controlling nature could easily be extended to Tim, thus presuming any DCAU-style projects produced by Paul Dini or Bruce Tim to be more viable as canon than those that would not. And as luck would have it, Paul Dini's name finds itself big and bold on the front of every issue of Batman The Adventures Continue. 
On top of this, back in 2017, BTAC artist Ty Templeton addressed his Batman Adventures Volume 2 continuity in relation to that of his newest DCAU comic at the time, the Batman and Harley Quinn sequel series, saying, Since so much of what Dan and I did in the last volume of Batman Adventures was ignored in continuity for the new Batman and Harley movie, I had to more or less shunt it aside for the sake of the project. I figured if I had to choose one canon over another, I chose whatever was on the screen first and foremost. You sweep stuff that doesn't fit under a rug and move forward. While it can be debated whether or not the Batman and Harley Quinn continuity does indeed disrupt that of Batman Adventures Volume 2, these words from Templeton do fall in line with a particular methodology that may be even more paramount from a man who holds more DCAU tie-in writing credits than any other person. If something new contradicts the old, then the old gets cast aside. So it seems relatively clear. With Paul Dini attached as co-writer and the artist willing to allow his own continuity to fall by the wayside if necessary, the adventures continue almost by default overwrites any contradictory elements from other DCAU tie-in comic books. And with the intention of the adventures continue seeming to be the, well, continuation of Batman the Animated Series, we can safely proceed from here in a manner which ignores the likes of Batman Adventures Volume 2, Batman Gotham Adventures, or even the original Batman Adventures, at least for now. Which leaves us with the new question. How does this new comic series fare against continuity of undeniable canon? The Cartoons. It's Batman, and he's back because he never left. The sky is blue, then red, then blue again, then red again. Have you even seen the sky on the show? Batman's batterings and grappling hooks vary wildly in shape and size every time we see them. Cassidy is tied up to a vertical pole while it was horizontal in the cartoon. Condiment King is still around as a villain, but in Make Him Laugh, he was definitely just a normal comedian dude mind-controlled by the Joker. He didn't want to actually shoot ketchup at people. Killer Croc's lair exploded in the show, but is perfectly intact here. Did he rebuild it? Does Killer Croc know carpentry? Did he get the carpenter to help? Renee Montoya got promoted to a detective on screen, but is still a beat cop here in Chapter 7, and then back to a detective in Chapter 15. The Batcave has costume display cases several years before it makes sense that it would. Jason Todd has a brand new Robin suit in the flashback, but since it looks nothing like the suit Tim Drake eventually wears, why does that suit even exist? Where did it come from, and when did any previous Robin wear it? According to The Flash, Gotham City and Metropolis are 30 miles apart. Lex Luthor's airplane is in the sky at least an hour, likely longer. But jumbo jets usually coast just below 600 miles per hour. So how does it even stay airborne? For that matter, why did Bruce Wayne have to take his own private plane to Metropolis in World's Finest? Is the measurement of a mile longer by the logic of DC Comics? The robot can fly and Lex Luthor can fly in his armored suit, so why does he even need to transport with an airplane? So you have a comic book series for me? Yes sir, I do. It's a continuation of the 90s Batman card with some of the same writers from the show and the artist from its tie-in comic. Oh, so it's gonna pick up right where the cartoon left off? Well, it's sort of ambiguous. We're gonna call back to specific episodes and set the look of everything to be the same as it was back then. But we're also gonna pull from lore from the Justice League cartoon and say this is all still within the first year Robin is Robin. Well, that sounds like a complicated mess. It's gonna be pretty hard to keep track of what characters to use, like who's already had their origin story and who's alive and who's dead and all that. Actually, it's gonna be super easy, barely an inconvenience. Oh, really? See, we're just gonna never talk about it and ask the audience to be okay with stretching an already two-year time jump between Robins to three years without explanation. Uh, stretching timelines with no explanation is tight. I always figured stretching was what made things not tight, but you're the boss. I am the boss, and don't you forget it. I can't forget, because unlike the pretense of actual pitch meeting videos, we are literally the same person. <laughs> oh yeah, this one doesn't work as well. Whoops. Whoopsie. So we start off with a pretty tame story where Batman fights a giant robot that he figures out is connected to Lex Luthor, who fights him in a big green suit of armor that fires lasers. Oh, so that means the episode of Justice League where he got that suit has already happened? Unclear. What? So Lex also has a Brainiac head that he had the robot steal from Wayne Enterprises earlier. Why did Wayne Enterprises have a Brainiac head? Well, we're gonna say that Superman fought Brainiac in space recently and gave the head to Batman for science and stuff. Is it the same time we've already seen Superman fight Brainiac in an episode of his cartoon? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So Batman gets his butt kicked and goes and gets his own big suit of armor out of the Batcave. 
believe. A big suit of armor we've never seen before and could have been helpful in dozens of other situations in the past? Exactly. So Batman goes to confront the robot, and it turns out Superman was being held captive inside of it and bursts out with a big heat vision blast. Oh, wow, 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 wow. So they cart Lex off to prison or something, and that's the entirety of the first story. A bit iffy already, and kind of anticlimactic for how much we're going to build up the series beforehand, wouldn't you say? Well, that's just the surface level. See, there's a mysterious stranger who's lurking around in the pages of every issue, cryptically referring to his past, which will set up the finale to the comic. A mysterious stranger whose clothing and silhouette look exactly like the Jason Todd action figure? Yeah, we're just gonna lean into the fact that the reader knows the reveal is coming, and not worry too much about establishing a mystery. You mean like the basic story element that made Mask of the Phantasm, Return of the Joker, and dare I say it, Mystery of the Batwoman intriguing puzzles for the audience? I'm gonna need you to get all the way off my back about the storytelling of this comic, sir. We're making this to sell toys. Oh, okay. Thanks. So the next story Wait, is... let me stop you right there. Oh, why is that? Well, I feel like the people who watch these videos might be getting a little sick of the repetitive YouTuber satire and just want the straight facts. Now I miss the part where that's my problem. Oh, <laughs> memes. Memes. Well, I suppose we should transition this into the next segment, huh? Yeah, it was fun while it lasted. Was it? It was for me, anyway. That's all that matters. Are we still talking about this bit, or the adventures continue? <laughs> you tell me. I will not. Greetings, canon lovers, and welcome back to Casually Canon, where we talk all things canon, from movies to comics to books to really wherever our whims take us. The placement of Batman The Adventures Continue within the already established timeline of the DC Animated Universe is one of the most important aspects of analyzing its canonicity potential, but it's also pretty difficult to nail down. The creators of this comic themselves have only divulged a handful of statements regarding where they feel it makes the most sense to happen. Artist Ty Templeton clarified that, due to the appearance of Tim Drake as Robin, this series takes place before the events of the flashback from Return of the Joker. But that doesn't tell us too much. Considering DCAU producer Dwayne McDuffie has gone on record saying that flashback will more or less always take place at the tail end of present day stories. Issue number one of BTAC was described by Paul Dini as acting as a semi-sequel to the Batman Superman crossover episode World's Finest, which adds to a whole list of quotes regarding the comics placement being theoretically right after the new Batman adventures. Fans familiar with the Batman of the new Batman Superman adventures will be right up to speed. I didn't want it to feel like there's a big gap. I'm really happy it just feels like the next day. Or even a sci-fi article on the comic series that read, Dini and Burnett took a forward-reaching approach to the project and envisioned this new comic series as perhaps the never-seen season of Batman the Animated Series if fate had not steered their attention toward creating the futuristic Batman Beyond. So it seems from the get-go that the intention was to make this comic as if it was a brand new season of the new Batman adventures. And there's certainly a lot of evidence to support that. In chapter 6, Tim Drake mentions having only been Robin for a year, almost. Meaning we're within the first year of time following his origin episode, Sins of the Father. Which is backed up by Ty Templeton stating he drew Tim so he looks like he's maybe a year older. We also get mentions of things that occurred in the new Batman adventures, like Poison Ivy and Harley Quinn discussing the events of Holiday Nights, Clayface transforming into the Annie character from Growing Pains, ugh, such a tragic episode, the various references to World's Finest, appearances by Roxy Rocket indicating her origin origin episode The Ultimate Thrill has already happened, or even a literal flashback to the Firefly episode Torch Song. And maybe that's enough. We could safely say The Adventures Continue happens right after the new Batman adventures, right? Well, unfortunately, we have to call this Plan A. Plan B would be... It's actually during the Justice League cartoon. The first hint of this comes in the very first chapter when we see Lex Luthor sporting the same green armor-plated Lexo suit he wore in the JL episode Injustice for All, which definitely seemed to be constructed in that episode by the Ultra Humanite. This question was actually posed to Paul Dini on the DC Daily Show, where he and Jim Fletcher of DC Collectibles joked in unison, could, could be, be a prototype, which creates a possible explanation if this comic were to take place before Justice League. But in that same episode Injustice for All, we also see Batman come into possession of kryptonite for the first time. No, that little sliver he took from the crime scene in World's Finest doesn't count. He left that with Superman. Pay attention, folks. This which he uses to power the weaponry in his big Dark Knight Return style armor in this comic. There are a couple other things here and there that might lead one to assume a Justice League era placement for BTAC. Like how Clayface's defeat works kind of well with how he would come into the ownership of Morgan Edge by the episode Secret Society. Or how Firefly's whole thing with being horribly burned and brought back from the dead by Cobra would likely have to happen after his seemingly normal appearance in Only a Dream. But the big one comes with a reference from Deathstroke to 
9-11, something we've never had brought up in the DCAU before. This event, of course, happened in 2001, which, by Watchtower database timeline calculations, is during Justice League. Now, there are ways we can work around some of these things for sure, but there's even a plan C here, that Batman the Adventures continue is after Justice League Unlimited. For one, we see technology throughout the series that did not exist by the time of the new Batman adventures, like smartphones, drones, an iPad-style tablet. Even flat-screen TVs are kinda pushing it. The only other time we've seen smartphones on screen in the DCAU, at least at the time of this recording, is the one Batman has in Batman and Harley Quinn, which takes place during JLU. And as for the rest, it's much more modern-day tech than really makes sense for the 1990s, though I don't think I have to remind you about the big old Nokia phones in Batman Beyond, we get a reference to the actress Betty Hutton not being able to play Harley Quinn in a movie, which is assumed to be because she died in 2007, three years after the in-universe conclusion of Justice League Unlimited. And the Joker compares Mr. Wing and Straight Man fighting to the chicken fights, plural, from Family Guy, the second of which didn't happen until 2005, a year after Justice League Unlimited. But the obvious one comes in the form of the Suicide Squad, or as they were exclusively referred to in the DCAU, Task Force X. In the BTAC holiday special, members of the squad attend Harley and Ivy's Christmas party, who Harley herself refers to as friends from work. The first thing that comes to mind is the Batman and Harley Quinn tie-in comic, in which Harley first meets the Suicide Squad, and hints toward her joining them later down the road. A DCAU comic that was even written by Ty Templeton as little as three years before BTAC hit digital shelves. But since we're not counting comics, and Ty has dismissed his own comics continuity before, we can still look to the JLU episode Task Force X, where Deadshot was first brought onto the team. So since he's here with the other squad members, this issue has got to be after that JLU episode. Unless Harley calling them friends from work is because they all work at, like, Big Belly Burger in their off time, but I don't know about that. Not to mention, the Joker also references HBO Max. And that's a whole can of worms. Does it mean this comic is happening as late as 2020? The most interesting and frustrating part of all of this? Each of these plans kind of work on their own, but they can't all be true. Sure, maybe Betty Hutton isn't dead, just retired from acting like she actually did in the 1980s. Maybe Family Guy and HBO Max premiered earlier in the DCAU than they did in the real world. Or the Joker is super sane, like he's been shown to be in mainstream comics, aware of the real world and aware he's in a comic or a cartoon. He has talked to the camera a couple times before. Maybe 9-11 also happened earlier in this universe. It wouldn't be the first time real world history has played out differently than in real life. Like all the alien attacks we probably would have heard about, or like Carl Malone playing for the Lakers earlier than the real Carl Malone did. And with Middle East geography and political climate being drastically different in the DC Comics world than our own, who's to say 9-11 happened anywhere close to the same way? Placing it earlier in time probably wouldn't even be the most drastic change. But we keep coming back to this is all supposedly within the first year Tim Drake is Robin. That one line really throws a crowbar into things. And yes, that is a segue. Hello everyone, this is Running On Empty, Robin Review. Well, hello ladies, gentlemen, and everyone watching. This is Running On Empty, Robin Review. I am sitting here in the Walmart parking lot where I have just purchased this action figure. I've already taken him out of the box never removed from box, as they say, but I just had to get a closer look at this guy. This is Jason Todd from the Batman The Adventures Continue line. This is a new line from DC Direct. They take memorable DC Comics characters and put them in the animated style. And, uh, you know, I have to say this guy has me really intrigued. I, uh, normally when I review Robins, I like to stick to the animated style that they started in to begin with. So like this crime fighter Robin with Red Wing Skyfighter and Mirror Image Decoder, for instance. This came out in the 90s, just like the cartoon. But now they've brought this animated franchise back. And uh, I gotta be honest, this is a franchise I always look forward to seeing return, but their choices for it never cease to perplex. There are very few people whose list of favorite animated Batman movies would not include Batman Under the Red Hood. It's a fantastic film with solid writing and a voice cast that rivals the appropriateness of character choice to that of the DC animated universe based on one of the most famous Batman comic book arcs. So the very idea 
that Jason Todd, otherwise known as the alias Red Hood, who has arguably become a vital part of Batman lore in recent years, could exist in the same world as Batman the Animated Series is shockingly exciting. And yet, it wasn't a world that required a Jason Todd, or even had room for one. Back in August 1997, a month before the new Batman Adventures began airing on Kids WB, writer Paul Dini was interviewed for the now discontinued Wizard magazine, where he said in relation to Tim Drake's introduction, quote, We came up with our own origin for him, which we found out had parallels to the Jason Todd character. When we looked at Jason Todd's origin, we were surprised there were a lot of parallels. And in a 2018 interview with British sci-fi magazine Starburst, no affiliation with the brand of fruit flavored taffy, Dini elaborated that the animated series crew did not even like the character of Jason Todd and preferred to use Tim Drake for various reasons. In the Robin Rising special feature on the BTAS DVD box set, Dini even specified that Jason Todd's story would have been far too dark and grim for the network and it was ultimately abandoned. As far back as the conception of the new Batman adventures, Jason Todd was never the plan. Welcome back to the Will It DeCannon Show. It is Thursday, May 9th, 2019, and let's just jump into it. Now, first up, let's talk about how Jason Todd's inclusion in this universe completely upheaves the time gap between Batman the Animated Series and the new Batman Adventures. While Batman Adventures last year showed us 850 days passing between Dick Grayson quitting as Robin in 1997 and Tim Drake becoming the new Robin, there have been conflicting reports from the creative team about the actual amount of time. Many, many times we have gotten a definition of two years, including this Paul Dini interview from an issue of Starlog Magazine in June 1997. Now, you would think Paul Paul Dini would be on top of this, being master and commander of an overall timeline. Seeing as how in the letters to the editor of the final issue of Batman and Robin Adventures in December of that year, editor Scott Peterson wrote, Working in conjunction with Paul Dini, one of the animated show's producers, we came up with a chronological timeline of when and where things happened. And yet, on that same page, he explains, The new episodes of the animated series take place about three years after the old episodes. Paul Dini doubled down on this angle in the 1998 book Batman Animated, stating, For nearly three years, Dick had been out on his own, traveling the world not unlike the way young Bruce Wayne had. And now, folks, here in the adventures continue, we learn it has been four years since the incident in which Jason Todd was left for dead at the hands of the Joker, which would be during the Lost Years. On a surface level, this works pretty alright. Considering if the Lost Years really was three years, 245 days longer than the comic says it is, but eh, and we're almost a year after that time period here. Well, I think you can add 3 plus 1. But when you take everything else on the DCAU timeline into consideration, there are some definite concerns. What's going on, everyone? Jamie here from the Canoning. So uh, today we got word about a spicy new comic coming out uh, about Batman, the Batman cartoon that I grew up watching as a kid. It's a continuation. Uh, I gotta say I'm a little disappointed that it's just uh, more woke garbage made to ruin your childhood. Uh, I know <laughs> who could have possibly foreseen Jason Todd being put into the DCAU as a problem, uh, but really, this whole series is just created to pander to woke SJWs about gun control. Yes, uh, right from the very first issue, we see Jason Todd set up as the bad guy uh, for picking up a gun, and by the end, he's so radicalized that he joins an ex-military gun nut literally named Deathstroke. He was another bad guy in the series. It's all just liberal PC garbage. It's anti-military, it's anti-gun. It's like they looked at the fact that the only thing that can stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun and said, nah-uh, Batman can stop them too. I know it's being written by two of the guys from the original show, but they never put politics in that. They're just sold out to appease the mob so they don't get cancelled. It's a shame that every piece of entertainment that's come out since I took that media literacy course in college is just rife with virtue signaling these days. That did not happen when I was a kid. No, sir. But that's not even the worst of it. They're actively trying to erase our childhood as well and retcon it into oblivion. Not only are the old non-political Batman Adventures comics thrown out the window, like the left tends to do with anyone who makes a spicy joke on Twitter, but even things in the cartoons get tossed as well. Firefly is here before the new Batman adventure starts. Baby Doll only aged two years over the course of at least four. And while we're on that subject, there's a whole thing with the Lost Years miniseries. I know the comics don't count. They never did. But Paul Dini literally made the timeline for the Lost Years. And we just have to talk about it. It taking place over the course of three years just doesn't work with this comic. Jason says it's been four years since he was Robin. The Watchtower Database channel pinned down Dick Grayson's graduation happening in January of 1997, based off clues in the comic. But even if you only look at the TV show, 
and assume that the graduation happened around May like normal. They tell us that Jason became Robin close to Halloween, so at the very least, there's half a year right there. Then three more years until Tim becomes Robin, and another year by the time this comic actually happens. Given that we still see Dick Grayson as Robin during summer 1996, in Batman and Mr. Freeze Sub-Zero. This means leaving the Bat family would have been around May of 1997. Tim Drake would have come around sometime in late 2000 during the Justice League show, and this comic would be taking place in late 2001. This just doesn't make sense. Pushing the Lost Years from ending in 1999 to ending in 2000 is just as bad as you could have imagined, yes. This timeline shift essentially means the later Batman episodes, or at least a vast majority of them, are happening at the same time as Justice League, since that show's presidential race took place in 2003, where Lex Luthor was running for president. Of course, something today's climate would never allow to happen. But just about anyone who is in charge of these things uh, would tell you that there is no timeline. Everything present day is just taking place whenever the real world present day is. Ty Templeton recently said of the new comic, we're trying to entertain our readers, not set up flowcharts and work out our PhD thesis. And that those who are trying to build an actual calendar of this franchise are bordering on obsessive behavior. Yes, of course, sir. Well, let's see what Beware the Grey Ghost has to say about that. Oh, October 19th, 1992. Hmm, that doesn't seem to be this year. And uh, what about Cold Comfort? August 20th, 1997? Are we just uh, supposed to ignore these dates? And by the way, I'll prove it to you. Look, this isn't just the cartoon. Look at the Batwoman movie, 1981. 1982. There are Batwoman birth certificates floating around out there somewhere, people. It's not a conspiracy. The timeline exists. I am not going to just push aside the existence of clear, visible dates within the DCAU. They are there. They are real. The adventures continue. Cannot take place before Justice League. It has to take place during or after. There is no other way. It does not make any sense any other way. And yet, Tim Drake less than one year is Robin. It's right there, folks. I am spelling it out for you. What's up, Greg? Welcome back to another episode of What the Hell Do We Make of All This? The crew behind this comic really seemed to be excited to just jump back into the animated world and sell action figures without putting too much thought into how it might affect, like, everything else like the entire rest of the DCAU. But remember that plan they said they had? Deanie and Burnett took a forward-reaching approach to the project and envisioned this new comic series as perhaps the never-seen season of Batman the Animated Series if fate had not steered their attention toward creating the futuristic Batman Beyond. Paul Dini added on to this by saying, Alan Burnett and I approached the writing with the idea that we were doing the season you might have seen if we had not put the series aside to do Batman Beyond. Which, like, I get that probably means the approach was like, hey, let's do more episodes of the new Batman adventures, and I should probably not read any more into it. But I'm gonna. Kids WB flat out told the DCAU crew back in the day to stop the presses and start doing a show about teenage Batman, which wound up evolving into Batman Beyond. Like, kudos to those guys for figuring that out. Oh, sh man, uh, that sounds like a really dumb idea. Wait, we'll set it in the future. Nobody said we couldn't set it in the future. But if they weren't forced to do that show, the DCAU probably would have looked a lot different. Like we probably would have gotten to see that old version of the Justice League that we saw in like mac and cheese boxes and stuff. This alternate universe where Batman Beyond never happened and the present day timeline just kept going without Batman Beyond affecting continuity decisions. Okay, so hold up. If Batman Beyond never got created, then Justice League and Justice League Unlimited wouldn't have gotten created, at least the same way that we got. So then the Adventures Continue timeline could be that alternate timeline, and none of the Lost Years pushing or JLU overlapping would even matter. It's just a completely new DCAU. 
Wait, hang on, cut the silliness. This is actually really interesting. There's an old issue of Comicology magazine from back in 2000 where Bruce Timm talks about Batman Beyond and says of it being a hypothetical future, that's our out. You just say it's a possible future. But to us, it is what happens to Bruce Wayne. It fits our canon. The interviewer then asks if that sort of thing is important to the DCAU crew, to which Tim responds, to a degree. See, Batman Beyond co-creator Alan Burnett has gone on record saying he doesn't agree with the story decisions made for JLU's epilogue. I never wanted him to be, never wanted Terry to be and so I don't accept it. That's a very Batman Beyond thing. Ty Templeton even planned an issue of Batman Adventures Volume 2 where Tim Drake would escape the Return of the Joker flashback unharmed, where Joker doesn't even die. That issue never actually happened and we already pushed aside other tie-in comics, but still, same dude. The crew behind this comic are pretty on board the Batman Beyond is just a possible future train. Choo-choo! Not to mention all the little tiny things here and there that are different from what we'd expect. The arrangement of things in the Batcave, stuff like Lex's suit or Firefly's origin happening earlier than they should. It's not even unheard of for there to be alternate universes within the DCAU's multiverse where one little thing went different and changed the course of history. Justice Lords or Brave New Metropolis, anyone? Or however the hell they'll incorporate Flashpoint Batman, the Batman who laughs, Man, why didn't I see this earlier? Unpacking all of this data is a little overwhelming. Is this really all I have to go off of? Ah! All right, all right. Look, the goal of Will It Canon is far as I've been able to understand, has always been to try and debunk popular fan theories about certain shows, movies, or whatever fitting into the DCAU when they have no reason to. Before I broke the program, there was totally a backlog of Justice League Doom, Green Lantern the Animated Series, I think Crypto the Superdog was in there? But now that I can see things clearly, it's made me realize why not try to be as inclusive as possible? Why get bogged down in all the negativity? So what if you want some non-DCAU thing to fit into the DCAU? Headcanon that sh**! Do it! Who are you gonna hurt? Batman The Adventures Continue is a crazy roller coaster of this works great, no it doesn't, now it's fine, now what the hell are they doing? Oh my god, please stop, how could Baby Doll possibly be only 32 years old when she was 30 in her first episode? But it's out there. It exists. It's intended to be new DCAU stories. And whether we like it or not, despite all its problems, man, this whole canon thing, who really gives a crap? There's so much back and forth here. There's too much hate that comes out of it. There's a lot of continuity problems in this comic, but there's also a lot of cool stuff. Slade Wilson in the DCAU? Yes, please. Death in the Family, BTAS style? How could I be mad at this? This thing is awesome, right? Right? <laughs>
सकते हैं